Next controversy here uh, on the Barbell Medicine Podcast, we're going to talk about slow metabolism or high fructose. So what's the controversy here? Well, it's, you know, everybody knows it's harder to lose weight as you age. It's a tale as old as time. And uh, for those with uh, weight struggles, well, they probably have a slower than normal metabolism because that's how they ended up, um, how, how they are, right? I mean, duh, you just, just think about it. Uh, that's the controversy. Why this controversy exists, again, I think it goes back to weight management is challenging. And it certainly does feel harder for some. The exp their experience at trying to manage their weight to whatever their goals are, for some individuals, it does feel like a much more uh, uh, monumental, in some cases, even insurmountable task. And I think metabolism tends to be the scapegoat for, quote, all things that are beyond an individual's control. And I think this is really referring to an individual's genetics, their specific environment, and ultimately the response to the, the combination of those two things, a person's genetics and their environment. And so people are like, well, why am I having such a challenging time, you know, leaning out or achieving this particular physique or whatever compared to these other folks? It just must be my metabolism. It's slower. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Does that seem reasonable to you as far as like why see the, this we see these conversations all the time, whether just age related or often like in the perimenopausal, postmenopausal world, things like that. Just quite common kind of topics of conversation. Yeah. Uh, OK, so let's see if we can come up with a consensus here. Metabolism, as measured by your resting metabolic rate and its combination with your, the thermic effect of food, so that's diet-induced energy expenditure, how much energy it takes to break down, store, metabolize food, et cetera, and your activity-related energy expenditure. So all of that stays remarkably consistent as an adult until the middle of your seventh decade, so about 65 or so for most uh, folks. It's a little bit longer. It stays pretty, pretty consistent for active. There are really like four distinct stages of, quote, metabolism where it's pretty much the same. So early, you know, childhood, uh, adolescence, that's your second phase, adulthood, uh, and then after, you know, 65 or, or a little bit older, it seems to decline. But the most of your adult life, metabolism, metabolic rate is effectively the same. Um, and individuals with excess body fat, so individuals with obesity, they have the same metabolic rate per kilo of body weight. Sometimes it's even higher. Uh, experimental evidence uh, can show that as well, like up to a couple hundred calories per day. And there's no real difference in sort of uh, like as far as weight gain goes and those who quote have a high basal metabolic rate uh, versus a lower basal metabolic rate. Um, so there's no real experimental evidence that shows that, look, people with excess adiposity, excess body fat uh, have a slower metabolism than their lean counterparts. Um, so I think what we're seeing here is just a sort of unique – I don't know. It's kind of like a, it's kind of like a, an experiment that's taking place in, in real time. Like we've changed our environment such that the genetics that are relatively stable are producing a pretty predictable response. Our genetics are not set up for the modern food environment, the modern activity environment where we are less active and where we have access to all of these foods that are very, very tasty, very desirable, easy to access, cheap, high in calories, but not very filling. Well, medicine podcast. And our genetics are such that like, Ooh, what is this? So individuals who are exposed to those, you know, far more than uh, individuals who aren't based on where they live, based on their socioeconomic status or whatever. Well, the, the outcome is predictable. They're going to gain body weight up until a certain point, and they're going to kind of plateau off. This is probably best modeled by what's called a dual set point theory by Dr. Speakman. Now, this is still kind of speculative, but I do like this model for conceptually understanding what happens with weight regulation in adults um, in developed societies. That is, there is a low body weight, body fat level that your body defends vigorously against once you start to approach it, because that would increase your risk of dying from disease or otherwise, you know, not having enough, quote, fitness. And I don't mean that in like a CrossFit type setting or like exercise related setting. I mean, fitness in the biological, with the biological meaning, like, oh, you can't reproduce because mm -hmm. you're going to die, you're infertile, whatever. Uh, so vigorously defends against that should you approach that. And you have a upper level of body weight and body fat uh, sort of set point that your body would theoretically defend against should you get up that high. But the problem, and that's like for a pre predatory risk, right? Or also reduce levels of fitness where now your fertility has been compromised. But that's so much higher than what society views as like attractive or desirable or whatever. And so we've seen this sort of gradual shift towards that upper end, towards that upper set point. But it's just much higher than most people would prefer. Does that seem plausible to you? Seems very biologically plausible. I think both of us have historically found this uh, proposed model or, or explanation pretty compelling.
I think that yeah. just at selection pressures and and sort of almost like incentives in, in a certain way, biological incentives as another term to describe what we'll call selection pressures or lack of selection pressures uh, can have a super potent effect um, on like gene environment interactions here. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think so when people just blame their metabolism, maybe what they're really talking about, and this is something that is definitely true, it, they're, maybe they're not really saying or not really meaning, maybe unintentionally, that their like basal metabolic rate is slower on average than another person of similar body mass, lean body mass, activity level, whatever. Maybe they're not saying that, but what they're saying is like, look, when I try to change my, my diet or increase exercise, I don't get the same response mm -hmm. that my friend does. Mm -hmm. And to that, I say, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it'd be like that. And, and we can call that metabolic adaptation, maybe more technical term, adaptive thermogenesis. Uh, but yet people... Uh, you know, changes in body weight produces changes in body mass. So you lose some lean body mass, uh, for example, which in turn changes resting energy expenditure. That's somewhat predictable. But amongst individuals who are, so, quote unquote, resistant to weight loss, a number of other changes are going to occur. They're going to have a greater than normal reduction in their basal metabolic rate. They're also going to see a uh, greater than normal reduction in their activity-related energy expenditure. And that's not just exercise. That's non-exercise energy expenditure. They're going to twitch less. They're going to shiver less. They're going to move less. And that's all subconscious, right? Their hunger is going to go up. Their feelings of fullness or satiety are going to go down. And for folks who are very, very resistant to weight loss, it's a tough road. I agree. And I understand that that experience can, is very, very challenging, you know, defeating and, and whatever. But that doesn't mean that you have a slow metabolism. All it means is that your genetic lot in life is much more poorly suited for the modern environment than some other folks. And yeah, if your intervention, if the proposal was, well, let's change the environment, we would say, yeah, let's do it. Yeah. And to the extent that's not feasible, uh, you're living in the best time in history to have tools to manage it, right? Totally. Uh, it may not be your preferred method if it involves the use of certain meds or surgery or something like that, but we've never before had the level of, you know, potential inter, you know, intervention control over this as we do uh, today at this moment and tomorrow we'll have even more because a lot of these things are being studied you know this this conversation around metabolism there's there's two examples that i can think of that are really commonly cited one is what you mentioned where somebody says you know i'm not getting the same results as this other person that i know or i know somebody who can eat a ton of food and they never gain weight and then i you know eat very little and i feel like i either do gain weight or i can't lose weight there's a couple variables there one is just the intrinsic biological variation between these two people that may lead them to have different, you know, results from, from these things in the modern food environment. The other is something that we talked about earlier, that uh, it's very likely that they are overestimating the amount of calories that that person is consuming in a 24 hour period, for example, maybe they see them eat a large meal, but they don't see the meal that they skipped. <laughs> yeah. yeah. At a different point of the day. And they're severely underestimating the amount of calories that they consume. This is just what humans do. So there's some, uh, you know, estimation inaccuracies there. There are probably some unaccounted for variables. And then, yeah, there's the biological variation between people. We could, you and I could both sit here and complain that, hey, we could try running uh, Ed Cohn's deadlift program and we didn't deadlift 900. You know, come on, man. Sorry. Like, <laughs> just try harder. It's not, we're not, you know, the same organism. Uh, we have, you know, different, uh, different things that are going for us and different things that are not in our, in our, in our favor here. So there is some biological variation between people, even if they are doing the same thing, you know, we put people on similar programs and we're going to see diverging results. You put people on a similar diet, you're going to see some diverging results for reasons that are both within and out, outside of their control. The other aspect of the metabolism piece, not just comparing between people, uh, between adults, for example, is, uh, well, it was different when I was younger. And, you know, when I was a, a kid, I didn't have to think about this and I could eat whatever I wanted and things like that. And by and large, I think that a lot of that, there's, there's certainly some, depending on how long ago you were a child, there are likely to have been some changes in the food environment and things like that around and alcohol use and all sorts of other things that can come into the picture across the lifespan. But activity level is a massive, you know, variable that changes, um, you know, over that period of time. I think about some of my friends' kids these days that I see that are like in the, you know, four or five year old time frame, and they're just like constantly throwing their bodies around all over the place, doing doing stuff, playing, you know, uh, just ex like hyperactive, you know, moving yeah. around, uh, arguably. And that's something that, you know, obviously, if we saw uh, an adult behaving in that way, we would view it as concerning or culturally uh, maladaptive or something like that. 
instead they're you know maybe potentially sitting in office chairs in a cubicle for a fair amount of the day and and uh, perhaps not otherwise meeting or exceeding physical activity guidelines and things like that so that's another variable that changes across the lifespan within a person that might be perceived as a decrease in metabolism and it's like kind of if you look at like maybe total you know activity that you're doing or something like that but not your basal metabolic rates, not the, the those types of functions that we can measure that appear to be quite consistent across the time, time span. And your dietary patterns have also shifted from childhood to adulthood. So there's a lot of like explanatory variables that can, uh, you know, get at these experiences that people have and then kind of jump to the conclusion of it's it's my metabolism that's that's changed. Yeah, generally speaking from like adolescence, we'll call it or in childhood and adolescence to like adulthood, you're no longer growing. So sure metabolic rate per kilo has, has gone down a little bit because you're no longer growing, uh, especially not yep. at the rate that you were. You're likely to be less active. And then again, depending on how much time has passed, let's say if you're in your sixth decade now, so you're in your 50s compared to when you were a child, you know, in the uh, uh, early 80s or 70s, oh, the food environment has changed yes. drastically. As far as yes. also it's like, nor like normal dietary practices, uh, for example, more, much more meals are being uh, consumed that are prepared outside of the home, portion mm -hmm. sizes are bigger, all sorts of stuff. But that doesn't mean that your metabolism has crashed. Yeah. Just, if we if we transplanted you in your state with your current metabolism into a different food environment, you'd be likely to do fine. If we had control yeah. over that food environment, if it was a better up, food environment, if we could set it up the way we wanted, yeah. But if but we could also set it up in a way that's even worse, and yep. we could predict the results there too. Yeah. So. Food food industry would love that. All right.